men are, well, really depraved creatures. And, I mean, Yo's body has features that are totally different than yours, right? So, even though it's totally different from my, different from my love for you, I can't help but get, um, aroused. With each word I squeeze from my lips, Saya seems more and more amused, until she finally starts shaking with laughter. The fuck is wrong with these people? I know, I know, she exclaims joyfully, patting my shoulder with one hand and wiping tears of mirth from her eyes with the other. There's no reason to be ashamed of your natural male instincts, is there? Sometimes. If you're really that worried, then let me join it. Whoa! When you play with her, we can enjoy ourselves in ways that we couldn't when it was just the two of us. Okay? Are you sure? I ask again as though trying to force her to say no. Sai answers me with a simple, with a smile that I've never seen before, and it's calm, so terribly calm, and there's something bewitching about the soft set of her lips that makes that whole, God, I, this is so much smut I can't even handle reading it right right now, makes it wholly unlikely her usual bright childish smile. You and I are lovers, and Tesca Bayo is our pet. She'll be reminded of that when we play with her every day from now on. I finally know why Saya chose Yo, for the venom in her voice and smile does not escape me. Although she can no longer answer, if asked, Yo would surely have chosen to be killed rather than meet this end. I have no doubt that she is experiencing now as a fate worse than death, which is the very reason that Saya did this to her. How wicked and terrible Saya is. Perhaps others would fear and loathe her. To me, however, her malevolence is irresistible charming. The horrifying cruelty of what she has done to Yo is so very human. Though her shape may be different, her soul is the same as ours. When I look upon Yo's wretched form, I see the intensity and passion of Saya's love for me. For the flames that have consumed Yo are fueled by the very love. I find myself enthusiastically accepting Saya's present. Saya, do you like this present too? Or this pet too? Yeah. She's very pretty. And feels good to the touch. So you'll be able to enjoy playing with her too, right? I don't have to hold back, do I? Of course I will. Grinning happily, Saya grabs the chin and pulls Joe to her feet. Uh Try touching her, Fuminori. She's really nice and soft. Okay. As Joe looks at me with teary, pleading eyes, I approach and let my gaze roam freely over her lush body and ripe breast. I run my fingers through her hair, finding it smooth as Saya's. Enjoying the feel, I continue to gently caress Yo's head. Her fearful expression softens a little. Perhaps she remembers me in some part of her mind. Still thinks that I'm someone who would be kind to her. How foolish. Yep. Okay. Um. Yeah. As I lie on my bed, completely drained of energy, I consider what my life will be like from now on. Sai is sleeping in my arms, and Yo is sleeping curled up on the floor. Yesterday I could not have imagined that the three of us would be a family. A new home, new food, new family, all granted to me by Saya. To soothe my, despa to soothe my despair, she has selflessly led me from the brink of death to find new joy. And I, too, have changed. I have killed two people who were nuisances to me, and have made it a third my mindless slave. Yet despite all what I have done, I am still able to sleep peacefully. Without a doubt, I am no longer Saka Saka Fuminori. I am no longer the Saka Saka Fuminori I once was. 
How far will Saya go? What will I become? I feel somewhat unsure, though not discouraged about the unknown world into which we are heading, and so while playing with Saya's hair, I ask, Saya, just what are you? I don't expect an answer. Saya's a sleeper doesn't want to respond. I won't mind. Saya turns to me, however, and draws my gaze into the deep pools of her eyes. It's kind of hard to explain. She thinks for a while, as though searching for the right words, and then says simply, You know the dandelion flower? The one that scatters its seeds on the wind? Yeah? The wind carries those fluffy seeds far, far from where they're born. What if one of them ends up in a desert, where not even a single blade of grass is growing? If you can imagine how that lone seed will feel, then you might be able to understand me. As I consider Sai's answer, she continues her story. This seed is a baby plant, after all. If it does its best, it can turn even a desert into a garden. Maybe that little seed will decide to try its hardest. Maybe it will decide to grow and multiply so that it can turn the whole desert into a field of dandelions. What do you think can give that dandelion seed the strength to do so? What? Saya smiles softly and caresses my cheek. All it needs is to be loved by just one person in the whole desert. All it needs is to be told how pretty dandelions are. The loving touch of her slender fingers fills me with peace and joy. I love you. I pull her into my chest, nodding silently. Stay with me forever. Never leave my side. Of course. Basking in the soft warmth of our love for each other, we sink into an oblivion of sleep. He's been buried alive. His whole world is in the silence and cold of the grave. Ever since his voice gave out and he lost his strength to scream, no coherent thought has run through Koji's mind. Perhaps his brain was being mercifully shut down by forgetting who he is and why he is trapped in that dark well. He's able to ignore the freezing cold that is gradually draining his life. Instead, he dreams. Images flash before his eyes, random, unconnected scenes from his twenty-odd years of life. Not all are happy times. There are sad, painful memories as well. But even these are merciful for they are pleasantly warm compared to the death that is encroaching upon him. He dreams of mountains. His older brother had taken him hunting for insects when he was a child. They would sealed the butterflies that wouldn't fit in their cage into a plastic bag, and later from the bag filled with wings of suffocated butterflies. He dreams of his lover. They would met at a mixer when he had been only the only one to realize that she couldn't hold her liquor after she had too much to drink. He looked like he looked after her while she vomited in the back alley. They toast each other with canned juice, and then he dreams that he is diving into the back the black depths of the night sea. When he reaches the bottom, he looks up to see the moon shining over the surface of the water. As he gazes up at the circle of light entranced by its roundness and brilliance, he listens absently to the distant sound of a car. Something still conscious within him tells him that his dream is wrong. Have I ever gone diving into the ocean at night before? The dots begin to connect in his mind, forming a barrier to separate his dreams from reality. What is bothering him? Of course the car. He can hear the sound of an engine coming from far away. The engine noise has gradually changed to a low idling. The ab then abruptly give way to silence, followed by the sound of a door opening and closing. It sounds like someone drove up and got out of the car. 
This isn't a dream. These sounds are real. Understanding comes like a sudden blow. This isn't the bottom of the sea, and that circle of light isn't the moon. It's the mouth of the well. The sun has risen as someone is right outside with a car. The last piece of the puzzle falls into place, and he becomes Tony Koji once more. Help me, Koji shot, surprising how easily his voice emerges. Perhaps he is desperate enough to subconsciously block out the pain of his raw throat. Hey, I'm down here, in the well. Help me. He keeps screaming with all of his might. Soon the echoes in the cramped well become deafening, and he is no longer sure if his screams have meaning or if he is just howling wordlessly. Nevertheless, he continues. His only desire is to be heard, so that whoever is out there will know that he is dying at the bottom of this well. Koji's wait is not long, but it feels like an eternity when spent at the boundary of hope and despair. Soon the circle of light above him is partially eclipsed by the silhouette of a person staring down the well. Tonokan, are you alive? It's a woman. Although her voice is not familiar, Koji has heard it somewhere before. For some reason, however, he can't remember who it belongs to. Just hold on. I'll get you out of there. The silhouette vanishes, restoring the light to the perfect circle. Fear being left alone again threatens to send Koji into a panic. But his reason has recovered enough for him to resist the urge. She said she's going to get me out. He reminds himself, I haven't been abandoned. While waiting, he gingerly tests out his body, which he had, had which he had forgotten about all about until now. His joints ache, and his fingers and toes are numb, but nothing is completely immovable. Though exhausted, he is definitely still in one piece. After some time, the silhouette reappears at the top of the well. Are you hurt? Can you climb a rope on your own? No, I don't think so. Koji lacks the confidence to attempt such a feat with his fingers barely moving. Hmm. Oh well. I'm coming down. After a brief pause, the owner of the voice tosses a knot. Tosses a knotty climbing rope into the well. He grabs a rope as soon as it reaches him. It's definitely it's definite presence filling him with true relief. Finally free from his despair, he's able to start asking questions. Specifically, who is his savior? The rope shakes as the woman climbs carefully down the ladder. The beam from the floodlight slung over her shoulder, pushing back the shadows cast by her body's body. She doesn't have to. She is soon standing over, standing in the same mud as Koji, and he finds himself face to face with Doctor. Were you expecting someone else? Koji couldn't have imagined that his savior would turn out to be Dr. Tenbo Ryoko, neosurgeon at the Tokyo University Medical Center. Instead of a white gown and tight skirt, she's wearing a heavy leather coat, denim jeans, and boots with no heel. Her practical clothes make it clear that she expected to come up hiking through the mountains. She's carrying not a flashlight, but an all-purpose lamp that can be toggled between a, a large electric floodlight and small side-mounted fluorescent lights. It's obvious sur it's obvious ugh, obviously survival gear rather than the sort of thing you'd find in an emergency kit. You look awful, Dr. Tenbo says wryly as she looks Koji up and down. Here, drink this. She pulls a flask out of her pocket and hands it to him. Don't chug it. Go slow. Take small sips. It should help a little. Thank you. Walking around with a flask is like something a middle-aged alcoholic man would do. Maybe Koji's just old-fashioned, but he can't imagine help but think that it's not the sort of item a young female doctor should be carrying. Nevertheless, he unscrews the cap and takes a swig, and struggles to keep from coughing as the potent liquid sears his tongue. What? What, what is this?
spirituous vodka. It's a good antiseptic or disinfectant, and it also does a fine job of setting certain things on fire. Her straightforward, no mystical tone makes it clear that she's quite serious. Koji could only gape at the doctor, the dark smile on her face doing little to ease his confusion. Is she really Dr. Tenbo Ryoko? There's no trace of the bookish smile man or doctor Koji met at the hospital. Her expression is now set in a hard mask, and her eyes are sharp and wary. In the darkness of the ball in the well, it's possible, however, unlikely, that the change in her features is caused by the ominous shadows cast by her lamp. It's not so easy, however, to explain the change in her demeanor. Uh, why are you here? You're the one who called me, aren't you? Ryoko replied brusquely, glaring at Koji like she would at a student who just said something foolish. I get a strange message from someone off looking for a missing person, but neither he nor his friend answer when I try to call back. Am I supposed to think everything's fine? No. Although Koji still doesn't understand why she acted so quickly, it's a different part of what she just said that seizes his attention. What about Tuskova? You call Tuskova Yo, too? I did, but she didn't pick up either. To be honest, I figured you were both corpses already. That's right. He was almost killed at the hands of the man who believed was his best friend all along. Anger and frustration well up inside of him. He can't forgive Fuminori's betrayal, nor can he forgive himself for his foolishness. Now he has no idea if Tuskabayo is safe. If Fuminori tried to kill Koji, he could have done the same too. Calm down, why don't you? Ryoko says irritably, without even looking at him. Getting all pissed off here won't solve anything. If he thought something was wrong, Koji says to her back. Then you must have called the police, right? The police? Still engrossed in her examination of the walls, Ryoko laughs scornfully at the idea. So you still think this mess can be cleaned up like that, do you? What's that supposed to mean? Starting to get annoyed by her overbearing attitude, Koji is about to demand answers when she cuts him off with a gesture and shines her light at the corner of the well. You didn't notice this, Tonokan? Huh? In the light of the lamp, Koji sees that some of the stones are clearly different than the rest of the wall. This must be what Ryoko was looking for while ignoring him. Huh? No. There wasn't enough light to see. Hmm. Ryoko's gaze moves slowly along the wall, finally to come to a rest on a gate between two of the between the two stones. The hole is just wide enough for an adult to reach in open handed. You seem to pick the right well to fall down, Ryoko says with a grim smile. Like they say, expect the unexpected. She wastes no time in thrusting her hand into the opening. After she fills around for a few seconds, Koji hears a thunk of something solid together behind the wall. Doctor? Ryoko pulls her hand out and gives the different colored stones a gentle push. With the rubble weights of shifting, the stone slides smoothly back into the wall. So that's how he fooled me. I had no idea this was here the last time I came. You've been here before? Koji wants answers, but Ryoko ignores him and peers into the opening. In the beam of her flashlight, Koji can see a concrete tunnel leading into the mountain. I'm going on ahead, Tonokan. You'd better stay here. Her warning is simple and utterly devoid of warmth. 
Considering his options, Koji looks from the tunnel to the rope and back again. He's practically sweating now, thanks to the nearly 20 proof vodka he had just drank. But although feeling has returned to his fingers, he still doesn't have the strength to climb the rope. To be continued. Damn it, Fuminoi, you can't do a job right, can you?